So next up in our goal to address this global tapestry, you know, different areas of the world from about 1200 to 1450 is Southeast and South Asia. All right, so we got Southeast and then with South Asia, a lot of it is the Indian subcontinent. So to contextualize, Southeast Asia refers to land in subtropical Asia and also about 20,000 islands in the Pacific Ocean. And again, it's mainly India that we refer to as South Asia. Now, seagoing voyages are somewhat common amongst those living on the coasts, and travel between islands and along shorelines is often much easier than travel on inland routes. Traditionally, the region is sparsely populated, and the people will mostly take advantage of the monsoon winds and the rains that come along with them. All right, the winds we'll see are critical for travel in the Indian Ocean, but the monsoon rains will be, you know, used in the summer to store water for the rest of the year. Now, often farmers would cultivate an area until they'd exhausted the soil, and then they just move on. This meant that there weren't many nations with fixed borders in the region. Now, in this area, we will see Hinduism takes on a special importance. I mean, often there's this fusion of Buddhist and Hindu ideas, but it's worth looking at Hinduism momentarily. Now, it becomes prevalent in the region by the year 1000. Hinduism has its origins as what's called a Vedic religion, as it was maintained by Brahmin priests. But Hinduism includes more direct contact between the gods and its worshipers. The central deities to this religion were Vishnu and Shiva, and each of these gods derived from traditions that involve fertility cults and female deities. Now, whenever demonic forces threaten the cosmic order of things, Vishnu appears in one of several incarnations. Meanwhile, Shiva is said to live in isolation in the Himalayas, and represents both the creative and destructive parts of the life cycle. So it's a cyclical process. Now, all gods, and depending on who you ask, there can be millions of them in the Hindu pantheon. All of them are the manifestation of a single divine force. And this is often represented, as you see here, in statues that are half Shiva, half Vishnu. And this also reflects the true diversity of the Indian subcontinent. So contextually speaking, we have an idea of the way of life these people lead and how Hinduism will play a role. Now, there are several Southeast Asian states for us to take a look at. The first, you know, the first two we see here. First, we've got the Sri Vijuya. And their rise to prominence was a little bit before our time frame, but it still tells us much. They're based in Sumatra, and they owed its power to the control of the flow of trade that came through the Straits of Malacca. Now, this was born out of the competition among small ports in the region to attract trade and travelers. Now, with access to supplies of gold, along with the spices and taxes, it collected from ships passing through this choke point in trade between East Asia and the Indian Ocean. We do see that the Srivajuya became fabulously wealthy and, again, cosmopolitan. Now, the Khmer Kingdom of Angor gets more into our time frame. It's centered in what's now Cambodia, and they had a strong agricultural base but also traded forest products with Chinese and Indian merchants. The leaders spoke what was called the Khmer language. Now, the first ruler of the Khmer kingdom was a devotee of the Hindu deity Shiva, while other deities ruled over smaller realms. All right, this analogy was used to consolidate power. 
where the leader would rule over the human universe and the surrounding chieftains would rule over their own areas. Now this leader was a, you know, was a bhakti teacher. He was a member of what's called the bhakti movement who could bring rulers closer to Shiva. All right, this movement emphasized the personal tie between the devotee and the deity, where priests don't need to serve as intermediaries. And this was often performed in the home or expressed in poetry. So we have a more island-based kingdom with the Sri Vijuya, and then we have the land-based Khmer kingdom. Now, reflecting the Hindu and Buddhist influences on the region, we have the Borobudur and Angkor Wat. Borobudur, as you see at the top, massive Buddhist monument in Java. It's a Buddhist monument that includes three miles of walkways that tell the stories of the lives of Buddha. But these stories are set in Java not in India, which is where Siddhartha Gautama, or the Buddha, was actually from. It was probably built in the ninth century, but eventually it was abandoned and covered with volcanic ash and vegetation when the area came under the Islamic influence. All right, so Islam will also spread to these areas. Now, Java, which is Indonesia, is largely Muslim to this day, but the monument still holds a special place in the country's history. And the Buddhist minority will celebrate the Buddha's birthday here every year. Now, in the lower right-hand corner, we see Angkor Wat. This is probably one of the more iconic monuments in the world. It is a Hindu temple whose central tower symbolizes Mount Meru, the cosmological center of the universe. Now, this, was, this Hindu temple was used by Buddhists in the late 13th century. And also, the state of Pagan, which is to the west, had numerous shrines and monuments dedicated to both faiths. Angkor Wat demonstrates the universality of architecture and the syncretism of both faiths. So, in this image... We see Hindu depictions, Hindu architecture, and Buddhist monks. Now, in these Southeast states, because of the strong economic, religious, and cultural influences from South Asia, many scholars spoke of a process of Indianization of the region. Now, there's a question mark here because the influence and impact of India is undeniable, but we don't want to overstate this process. All right, in other words, you know, the borrowing from India was voluntary. It's very similar to the Chinese influence on Japan, where they were able to pick and choose. Same too did Southeast Asia pick and choose. For example, Southeast Asian women had many more opportunities than women in South Asia. Lineage traced ancestry from the mother and the father's side. And women could own property jointly with their husbands and initiate divorce. We can see some images here of Angkor Wat. And there are 1,800 carvings of women at this particular site. And women served in numerous roles in Angkor society, whether it be as poets, artists, religious teachers, even gladiators and warriors. A Chinese scholar actually remarked about Angkor society, it is the women who are concerned with commerce. So those are just a few examples of Southeast Asian states. The main South Asian state we'll look at are what are known as the Delhi Sultanates. Now this is the Islamic political center in South Asia. The Mamluks, overthrew the reigning sultan in 1210 and conquered large sections of northern India. The five dynasties that were in control for about 300 years became known as the Delhi Sultanate. 
Now, by and large, you know, we see that the north was unified. The southern portions remained under control of other dynasties. Southern India was actually Hindu and was based at Vijayanagara. And they helped build Hindu temples while also promoting Sanskrit. You know, they ruled for two centuries. So the south remains ruled by Hindu. Now, Hindus in the Delhi Sultanates were granted the status of dhimmi, or protected subjects. Since the government was Muslim, Hindus had to pay the jizya tax and were not allowed to fight in the all-Muslim army. However, there were some points during this time when the government repaired Hindu temples that were destroyed by Muslim troops. The Sultanate was also known to blend Islam together with Hindu culture. You know, many Buddhists and untouchables or those from lower castes found hope in the universal message of Islam. The Sufis, these spiritual leaders that we've already seen spreading the faith, they helped make Islam more accessible to the populace by incorporating local traditions and deities, thus kind of making it more popular. Indians always had a reverence for holy men who were detached from the material world. So Sufis were the perfect people to spread the faith in this region. However, there are some major differences between Islam and the Hindu faith that are difficult to overcome. Now, Islam is strictly monotheistic and forbid any depictions of the Prophet Muhammad, while the Hindu religion is famously polytheistic. And, you know, Angkor Wat alone shows numerous statues and depictions of these deities. Remember that depicting Vishnu and Shiva together in a statue is very common in the faith. You just don't see that in Islam. Islamic spirituality will contrast with the rigid caste system espoused by Hindu culture. And truthfully, the modest Muslims were aghast at the erotic art of the Hindu faith. These differences made it difficult for Hindu culture to completely absorb Islam. And it does explain why even within this Delhi Sultanate that is ruled by Islam, only 20 to 25% of Indians will convert to the faith. 